finally. <laughs> Let's get it going. Uh, okay, I'm Marco. Uh, I want to first thank you all for coming, and especially our keynote speaker, David Chalmers. I don't think I need to introduce David Chalmers to anyone. So uh, I'm going to say a few things before. Uh, first of all, it's a great pleasure for us in the organizing committee to have you all here. I know that Chiradent is maybe a bit hard to get. So uh, really, thank you for coming. And let's try to make it a great event. Uh, and this is the first edition uh, of this Mind Brazil workshop. And hopefully, that's going to be the first one of many others. Uh, anyway, first, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, thank our uh, the founding agencies who made it possible, the uh, CNPQ, CNPQ, CAPES, the Brazilian agencies, uh, SESI Minas, Centro Cultural Ives Alves, uh, the Federal University of São João del Rey, UFSJ, uh, and the Department of Philosophy and Methods, the FIMI. Uh, and actually, it's a good idea to introduce David Chalmers. David Chalmers is well, now a landmark in philosophy of <laughs> mind, I guess. Uh, and at least since the mid-90s, he has been a leading figure in uh, the whole world and top discussions in philosophy of mind. And uh, he is a professor at the University of New York, uh, New York University and the National University, uh, Australian National University. Um, what else can I say about David Chalmers? <laughs> He's just David Chalmers. You're going to see it now. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to pass. Okay, muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Rodrigo and Gustavo and everyone else for their organization of this wonderful conference. It's a great honor to be the, uh, the guest at this first Mind Brazil workshop. I hope it's the first of many more. I see there's a, already on the website it says they will be, uh, the aim is to be a what, biannual conference every two years. I see we are already exceeding this expectation. <laughs> 2018, 2019, 2020. It's, uh, it's wonderful testament to the, uh, the vitality of philosophy of mind in Brazil, something I know about already very well from the uh, phenomenal concept, the wonderful phenomenal concepts conference organized in Rio back in 2011, and in many many visits to uh, to Brazil since then. So the topic is that uh, the conference is Mind Brazil. So um, I took it there as um, some implication one should talk on a theme in the philosophy of mind. So my topic today is, in fact, the, uh, the philosophy of consciousness, a theme I've been uh, thinking about now for, uh, for many years. Uh, my title is The Meta Problem of Consciousness. You might ask, what is a meta problem? Well, um, in psychology, let's see, a metacognition is cognition about cognition. A meta-theory is a theory about a theory. I once heard someone say that meta-x is always x about x. <laughs> now, any philosopher can immediately come up with many counterexamples <laughs> to this thesis. It doesn't work so well for meta-ethics, let alone for metaphysics. Nonetheless, it works for some cases, including this one. So a meta-problem is a problem about a problem. And what is the problem? So the meta problem of consciousness is to explain why we think and why we say there is a problem of consciousness. So that's a second, that's a higher order problem. What is the first problem that the meta problem is about? Probably not too much of a surprise for any of you. This problem is the hard problem of consciousness. And the hard problem 
is the problem of explaining why and how physical processes give rise to conscious experience. And here, the kind of consciousness we're concerned with is phenomenal consciousness. What it's like to be a subject in Tom Nagel's famous phrase, which talks about what it's like to be a bat. We don't know, but as long as there's something it's like to be a bat, then a bat is phenomenally conscious. A system is phenomenally conscious when there's something it's like to be that system. And a mental state is phenomenally conscious if there's something it's like to be in that state. So if there's something it's like to be you, you're phenomenally, <coughs> you're phenomenally conscious. If there's something it's like for you to be uh, seeing me or hearing these words, then those perceptual states are phenomenally conscious and so on. But maybe you believe that, say, Paris is the capital of France, and you already believed this a couple of minutes before I said so, so that will, presumably there was nothing then for you to, nothing it was like for you to have that belief then, so it was not phenomenally conscious. So phenomenal consciousness is subjective experience. The hard problem contrasts with the so-called easy problems of consciousness, which can serve which concern behavioral and cognitive functions, like perceptual discrimination, integration of information, control of behavior, and verbal report, all associated with consciousness, sometimes called consciousness. Um, but on the face of it, they seem more straightforward to explain. And the reason is that these easy problems all seem to concern behavioral cognitive functions. We have a paradigm for explaining those. The paradigm is we explain the easy problems by finding a mechanism that performs the relevant function, such as a neural mechanism or a computational mechanism. Find out what performs the verbal rep report function and how you've explained reportability, and so on. And this paradigm works very, very well many, for many problems in the Sciences. But for the hard problem of subjective experience, explaining behavioral functions seems to leave open a further question. Which is why is all this accompanied by subjective experience? Why doesn't all that functioning, all that processing, go on in the dark without any conscious experience? Or to put it in, in a in terms of a metaphor that I'll come back to, why aren't we all zombies doing all this without any experience at all? As Joe Levine famously put it, there seems to be an explanatory gap between physical processes and subjective experience. So that's the hard problem of consciousness, and there are many familiar approaches which we can divide broad into broadly non-reductionist and broadly reductionist approaches. I have argued myself for the view that consciousness is irreducible, or irreducible to physical processes at the very least. And that leads one to a, a variety of metaphysical views, including dualism, consciousness and the physical are separate, but each irreducible to the other, panpsychism, according to which consciousness is present at the basis of all physical Processes may be con helping to constitute the physical and idealism, where all, uh, where all that is fundamental in the universe is consciousness. The universe is entirely grounded in consciousness. And in other work, I've written somewhat sympathetically with all three of these views to try and explore them. But today, I'm going to take a different direction, just in the interest of you know exploring all the. In general, I don't have a very very strong commitment as to the solution to the problem of consciousness, and I'm interested in exploring all the avenues available, even ones that seem antecedently counterintuitive or even crazy. I think some crazy ideas may be needed to solve the problem of consciousness. On the side of reductionist approaches, there are familiar views like functionalism. Consciousness is reducible to functional or computational states and properties. Biological materialism, 
the consciousness is reducible to something neurobiological and even forms of quantum materialism where consciousness is reducible to some physical quantum process. In general, I'm much less sympathetic with these views than with the other views. I've argued against <coughs> them elsewhere, but I won't go so much into that today. Instead, I want to explore a different approach to the hard problem that focuses on the role of um, global reports about consciousness. And here, the starting idea is that there's one behavioral function that's really closely related to the hard problem. And this is the fact of phenomenal reports, the verbal reports that we make of conscious experience. So I say things like, all of us say things like, I'm conscious, I'm feeling pain now, and so on. And these are reports of conscious experience. Now these are facts of behavior. So in principle, explaining those reports is falls among the easy problems. But, um, but nonetheless, these are, these are facts of behavior that are at least very closely related to the hard problem of consciousness itself. Even more closely related are what I call problem reports. Reports expressing our sense that consciousness poses a hard problem. Now maybe these are not quite as widespread as phenomenal reports across the board. Almost anyone, I think, makes phenomenal reports, say when they report a state of feeling pain, Problem reports may be somewhat more limited to people inclined to philosophical or psychological reflection, but still they're, uh, they're very common. These are reports expressing our sense that consciousness poses a problem. So, you know, there is a hard problem of consciousness. That's an example of a problem report. Or explaining behavior doesn't explain consciousness. Or consciousness doesn't seem to be a physical process. It seems non-physical, and many, many ancillary reports, quite common among, certainly among people interested in the mind, but not all that hard to tease out of people um, without strong antecedent uh, views or experience in this area. These problem reports are also a fact about behavior. So the meta-problem of consciousness now, to a second approximation, is roughly the problem of explaining these problem reports. In principle, it's a puzzle about behavior, so it's an easy problem. And in principle, it looks like it thereby ought to be open to standard functional explanation. You know, the standard view is that behavior in general is open to functional explanation in terms of mechanisms and standard causal stories. In principle, the meta problem goes that way. Two. At the same time, it is an easy problem, but at the same time, it has an obvious close connection to the hard problem. I mean, because it's an easy problem, it looks more tractable than the hard problem. There's a clear avenue to, uh, to approaching it and trying to solve it. <laughs> Nevertheless, solving it ought to shed light on the hard problem, because presumably, you know, the causal explanation of our problem reports has some very close connection to the basis of the problem itself, something I'll go into a bunch later in the talk. Now this is this meta problem and thinking about explaining it is an instance of what philosophers sometimes call genealogical analysis, shedding light on a domain by analyzing how our judgments about that domain are formed. Uh, think about you know, Nietzsche and the genealogy of morals, for example. There are, there are many genealogical approaches to morality, to religion. Maybe instead of trying to explain God and study God directly, you try to explain the genesis of our beliefs about God. Maybe there's an evolutionary story or a psychological story about why these beliefs seem compelling or useful. This often, not, not always, but this often leads to what's called debunking our beliefs about this domain. And this approach has been especially popular in recent meta-ethics with the work of Sharon Street and Richard Joyce and others mounting debunking arguments in normative ethics or against moral realism. Later in the talk, I'll investigate 
the possibility for using the meta problem for a debunking approach to consciousness. If you take that approach, it tends to lead one to illusionism. This is a view that's only really fairly recently been named in the study of consciousness, but it's a view that's been discussed for a long time. Roughly the view that consciousness is an illusion. It doesn't really exist, but somehow just compelled to believe that it exists. Either consciousness is an illusion, or at the very least, the problem of consciousness rests on an illusion. On this view, explain the illusion, and we dissolve the hard problem of consciousness. So roughly, this view connects the meta problem and the hard problem in a very direct way. Solve the meta problem, and you will dissolve the hard problem. That's broadly speaking a key <coughs> illusionist strategy. So illusionism has, I think, a long history in philosophy. You can even find elements of it in Kant, I think in the paralogisms where he talks about the transcendental illusion of the self, which is responsible for our intuition that the self is, is unified and indivisible, and thereby leads to intuitions of dualism in that domain. More recently, the Australian materialists used some illusionist strategies to explain our intuitions of dualism. UT Place appeals to a so-called phenomenological fallacy. David Armstrong appealed to what he called the headless woman illusion. I'll talk about these a bit later on. In more recent years, Dan Dennis has made, a, has a, has made much of the idea that consciousness somehow involves or arises from a kind of user illusion from the first person perspective. And most recently, uh, Keith Frankish has um, wrote an excellent paper on illusionism as a theory of consciousness, really trying to lay out the illusionist strategy in general. This made the basis of a uh, special issue of the Journal of Consciousness Studies recently on illusionism as a theory of consciousness. Here depicted somehow consciousness or at least our sense of consciousness involves some kind of magic trick performed by the brain. Makes you believe in consciousness, whether or not consciousness is real. And this is now made for a very nice book that I recommend to you. Um, I am not an illusionist about consciousness. I gotta say, I find the view fascinating, intriguing, interesting. If I was, I think it's probably my favorite form of materialism about consciousness, at least setting aside. You know, varieties of panpsychism that one might count as materialism. <laughs> Certainly my favorite form of deflationism about consciousness. If I was to be something in the vicinity of a reductionist, I'd probably be an <coughs> illusion. But I'm not. I don't think consciousness is an illusion. I find that here impossible to accept. Um, I'm a realist about consciousness. I take consciousness to be a data. Nonetheless, I take this view seriously. But a realist about consciousness, as someone who thinks consciousness is real and not an illusion, I think even if the meta problem has a solution in physical terms, solving the meta problem does not dissolve the hard problem. I don't think the meta problem and the hard problem are as closely connected as that. Nevertheless, I think the meta problem should be tractable, and I think the meta problem is an important problem that is closely connected to the hard problem, if not quite as closely connected as the illusionist thinks. I think solving the meta problem, in principle, will shed a whole lot of light on the hard problem, even if it doesn't solve it. And a bit later in the talk, I'll talk about connections between the two. Okay, so that's um, roughly the introduction. Now I'll say a bit more to, uh, to introduce and... Uh, set out the research program and to define the meta problem more carefully. I'll talk about potential solutions to the meta problem and impact on theories of consciousness. And in the last part, I'll talk about um, the issues surrounding illusionism and debunking arguments. I thought I might, since it's quite a long talk and we have a fair amount of time, I thought I might divide it into three parts, two sections at a time, and take a few questions um, after each of the, uh, the three parts. So I'll now go through the second 
second section, and then maybe we can take a few questions. Um, anyway, so the second section is on the meta problem research program. I think you can see the meta problem is opening up a potentially tractable research program, empirical research program for everyone, reductionists and non-reductionists, illusionists and non-illusionists. To some extent, you can do it in a way that's neutral on some of the metaphysical questions about consciousness. We can try to solve the meta problem and then think about the philosophical and scientific consequences. So what is the meta problem? I gave a couple of approximations. Here is a, uh, what I think is a somewhat more precise statement of it, which I'll then go on to explain. Um, I said roughly it's a problem of explaining a problem report or explaining why we think there's a problem of consciousness. More precisely, I'd say it's the problem of topic neutrally explaining problem intuitions, or at least explaining why this is impossible, if it is. That introduces three new elements, problem intuitions, topic neutrality, and the last clause of possibly explaining why this is impossible. I'll talk now about all three of those for a little bit, starting with problem intuitions. This is connected to the question of what is the explanation here? What is the thing we really want to explain? Is it reports? Is it judgments? Is it something else? One could, in principle, go with any of these. I'm going to go with intuitions construed as disposition to make problem judgments and problem reports. So There's really, I think, an underlying disposition that's very, very common here that is really close to what we want to explain. There's a question as to whether one could, should require these intuitions to be non-inferential, as people often do when they talk of intuitions. I think it's more neutral not to here, because there may be views on which the problem our problem reports arise from a long process of inference. So I won't require problem intuitions to be non-inferential by definition. Though I think plausibly the most important problem intuitions will be non-inferential. What are the core problem intuitions here? I mentioned a few already, but I think you know one could be a bit more fine-grained about it. To start with, there are metaphysical intuitions, such as you know, consciousness is or seems to be non-physical. There are explanatory intuitions, which are particularly central to my own treatment of the problem. You know, consciousness is hard to explain. Explaining behavior doesn't explain consciousness. There are knowledge intuitions, like Mary in her black and white room. If you want to know the case, Mary knows all the physical facts, but she's never had a color experience. It seems she doesn't know all the facts about consciousness, and she learns new facts when she leaves the room. <coughs> there are modal intuitions or conceivability intuitions, like the intuition about zombies that I touched on. It seems conceivable the physical processes be just as they are in a conscious being with no consciousness at all. So here's the other. The philosophical zombie, someone who seems like a normal human, doesn't have conscious experience. They have all the physical states, but none of the conscious experiences. And I think we'll be hearing a bunch more about zombies later today from, um, from Marco and Rodrigo, and later in the conference as well from Kati and others. Um, so those are those I think those I take to be the four four of the most central intuitions. Perhaps the first two are the most central. There are also other related intuitions, intuitions about the distribution of consciousness. The intuition that robots are unconscious, for example, or that groups are not conscious. Some people have. There are intuitions about the value of consciousness. Somehow the consciousness is, it matters morally. Maybe that is the locus of all moral status. Uh, intuitions about the self. Intuitions about how the self persists through time. How um, it might potentially survive death or move from body to body. And intuitions about qualities of consciousness involving the presentation of special qualities. Maybe there are others, but I'll tend to focus here on these first two. So, I think the problem of explaining these intuitions is in principle a highly interdisciplinary research program and in bringing in 
neuroscience, psychology, computer science, and philosophy. Some relevant work includes experimental philosophy and experimental psychology, studying people's intuitions about consciousness, uh, computational and neurobiological models of intuitions and reports, and of course, philosophical analysis. To date, there's surprisingly little of this research, although there is a bit, and I certainly would like to uh, encourage more along these lines. I mean, I think this is all, much of this involves empirical questions. It's indeed, and certainly an empirical question, how widely these intuitions are shared. Is it just a few philosophers uh, who have these intuitions, or a few people interested in the mind, or does it go wider than that? My own sense is that these intuitions are very widely shared, at least as well, at least as dispositions, and at least among those who have any inclinations to reflect on these problems. I mean, many people, of course, will deny some of these claims. A physicalist will deny that consciousness is non-physical. That doesn't yet show they don't have the intuition. Many physicalists will, will admit to having you know, non-physicalist intuitions and then say that those are overridden by other reasons. So on my construal, the disposition may still be there on that present, but is a, on, for someone like that, it's overridden by other commitments and other dispositions. That said, I, I'm certainly not claiming this, these intuitions are absolutely widespread. Perhaps there are some people who have no such disposition at all. There's not much current data on this. I think in principle this is subject to all kinds of empirical testing, cross-cultural studies, cross-linguistic studies, historical studies, comparing different periods, developmental studies, experimental, standard experimental philosophy testing, and so on. And it's absolutely going to be non-trivial to tease all these things apart and looking for underlying dispositions. I'll just lodge my own sense that at least my working assumption is these intuitions, or at least their basis, is very widely shared, arising from, I mean, of course, it's very likely that our problem reports and our problem intuitions are going to be affected by a mix of factors, some of which are going to be relatively universal. The existence of certain mental states, the existence of certain introspective mechanisms, some of which will be variable, including cultural and linguistic factors. It's an empirical question, just what that mix is. I'll lodge my own working assumption is there's something universal, at least underlying the existence of these intuitions and reports. But of course, that is empirically defeasible. I mean, there is a, there's quite a lot of current empirical work on intuitions about the mind, so called theory of mind. But most of it's not quite in this area. There's work on the development of the concept of belief over time and the emergence of false belief in kids. There's work on intuitions about the self, how it persists through time. There's, where consciousness is concerned, the central body of work concerns the distribution of consciousness in robots and groups. Not so much on, say, the explanatory gap and problem intuitions. Here's a nice book by Paul Bloom that uh, goes through quite a lot of this research, but again, not much on the problem intuitions. One nice recent paper is by Sarah Gottlieb and Tanya Lombroso uh, from last year called Can Science Explain the Human Mind? Testing people's judgments about when various mental phenomena are hard to explain and they find out they seem to be harder. People seem to think mental phenomena are harder to explain when they involve an experiential or introspectively or privileged access, some element to which we have introspective or privileged access. But I think there's room for much more work in this, uh, in this area. Okay, so that's problem intuitions. Now what about topic neutral explanation? So I'll understand topic neutral explanation to be explanation that does not mention consciousness. I mean, you might say, well, to explain phenomenal reports, why do we talk about consciousness? It's straightforward, because we're conscious and we notice it. Um, to explain problem reports, that's straightforward too. We're conscious, consciousness is problematic, and we figure that out. Somehow that's, a, that's, a, that's certainly a non-neutral style of explanation, not neutral, for example, between realism and illusionism. And explanations of that form, I think, are not quite as useful for my purposes. So here I'm going to restrict it to topic neutral 
explanation. So it is at least don't explicitly mention consciousness or close cognates. The paradigm might be something like a computational or algorithmic explanation of our judgment about consciousness produced by some computational algorithm. We could also bring in neurobiological or representational or historical forms of explanation. Again, as long as they don't explicitly bring in consciousness. Now you might think that somehow in doing this I'm somehow assuming an epiphenomenalist view where consciousness plays no causal role. I don't think that's right. Um, I don't mean to be assuming anything like epiphenomenalism here. I think topic neutral explanations are entirely consistent with a causal role for consciousness, including a causal role in our problem judgments and our problem reports, as on materialist, even interactionist, panpsychist views. We just say a very strong form of interactionist dualism is true. Consciousness is non physical, plays a causal role in affecting the physical world. Maybe consciousness collapses the quantum wave function, somehow that way brings about our problem report. So that's a view that I've been uh, myself exploring recently in work with Kelvin McQueen. Even that view, I think, is consistent with there being a topic neutral explanation of our reports and intuition. Yes, consciousness will play a role here, but that role will itself be characterizable structurally without specifying consciousness as a realizer. So instead of saying consciousness collapses the wave function and brings about the phenomenal reports, you'll give a structural explanation that says something like, hey, well, something collapses. Under these physical processes, something comes about that leads to a uh, collapse of the wave function in such and such a way with such and such probabilities. Maybe you could even write an algorithm for it that never mentions consciousness. This is just a standard approach on which you give structural explanations of causal roles of various phenomena without specifying the causal realizers. So here's kind of a, you know, you just say panpsychism is true and consciousness, physical processes are realized by consciousness. You can give a complete causal explanation that brings that in, but you can also give a structural explanation in terms of physical roles that's neutral on the underlying realizers. Doesn't mention consciousness, just a bunch of math. Um, Likewise, if interactionism is true, likewise are many forms of materialism. Maybe the structural explanation would be the best, but be a fully complete explanation, but it will still be a good explanation. That's how I'm thinking of topic neutral explanations here. It's also worth noting that for the meta problem to be an easy problem, the exponent has to be construed somewhat independently of phenomenal consciousness. We couldn't take the explanation here, for example, our judgments about consciousness to be our, our feeling, our phenomenal experience that consciousness poses a hard problem, because that experience is as hard to explain as any experience. Instead, we need to characterize the concepts and the states involved in phenomenal reports and judgments themselves functionally or topic neutrally. On many views, that will be straightforward. On some views, you know, there'll be views on which judgments involve some phenomenological or experiential element. Um, if you have a view like that, then I think you have to recarve the exponential, you know, carve the element out of judgments to have an element underlying these judgments or report abstract away from that. Ultimately, it could be something like a tendency to make noises or inscriptions that are naturally interpretable. In a, uh, in a certain way. That does kind of raise the possibility. I mean, some of you may be thinking, oh, well, with all these constraints, the meta problem may be hard to solve. So I think one should at least have that view on the menu as an option as well. It's at least a possible view that there's no topic neutral explanation of problem intuitions, at least with everything characterized topic neutrally. I mean, it's not straightforward. I don't find it straightforward to uh, come up with a view that has this form, where it basically would require that the causal role of consciousness is so unruly that it can't be domesticated via some kind of structural explanation. But maybe some forms of anomalous dualism, where consciousness is non-physical, plays a totally unsystematic role, or maybe anomalous monism could have that form. In any case, I think a really general statement of the meta-problem 
So to leave this as an option, explain why the explananda or the explanation, then the challenge for that view is to explain exactly why the explananda or the explanation can't be structuralized into consciousness independent terms. If you can do that, that's at least um, a possible view on the meta problem. Okay, so that's the, uh, the first two sections. Now maybe it's a, maybe at this point I can open up to any, uh, any questions, especially, especially class clarificatory questions about what's gone so far. But, you know, halfway substantive questions are, <laughs> are, uh, are also welcome. a short, short question but maybe without a uh, straight answer but uh, 
would you so you would say that we must presuppose that consciousness exists but we don't know exactly what it is so in a sense that we presuppose an, uh, something existing in so uh, we quantify o uh, existentially over consciousness without knowing what it is. Um, I know you, you are worrying <laughs> that for many years, but um, I, I would say that it's a hard beginning to begin in this way. I would begin uh, in another way, but... Yeah, well then I think you should be very happy with this talk in particular, because in this talk, I'm not presupposing that consciousness exists. In quite a lot of other work, I come close to making that presupposition. In this talk, I'm intending to be actually somewhat neutral between... Much of this talk is intended to be somewhat neutral between, say, materialism, between illusionism, on which consciousness does not exist, and realism, on which it does. Nevertheless, you're right that I favor the realist view, and as I said, I do take it most of the time to be a datum that consciousness exists. Do I take it to be a datum? Do I thereby accept the existence of something whose nature I don't know? This is actually tricky. I mean, I'm not unsympathetic to the view that in introspection, we know the nature of consciousness. If you take that line, then I, would, I don't think I'll be subject to your complaint. I accept the existence of something whose nature I know. Nevertheless, I don't want to start with such a strong assumption. Dialectically, that would be a poor place to start. It would exclude materialist views, for example, from the very, many materialist views from the very beginning. So dialectically, I'm much more confident that I know that consciousness exists than that I know its nature. And I at least want to leave open the possibility that it could have a surprising nature. Is that bad? Well, I think it's very common to accept the existence of something whose nature we don't know. In science, you know, you see something going on with the orbit of one planet, you know something must be causing this. You think, ah, another planet exists. I don't yet know its nature. Maybe that's harder with data. Maybe with maybe that's a better move with theoretical phenomena than with than with basic explanatory data, as I take consciousness to be. But at least it's not obvious to me that I mean, there's an epistemological issue about data that you know we know they obtain, and a metaphysical issue about them. Myself, I'm sympathetic. I think you take you're sympathetic with a close tie between the the epistemological issue and the metaphysical one. So am I. But I think there are many people out there who would be, uh, be happy to separate the epistemology from the metaphysics. And in the interest of casting a broad tent that includes those people, including many materialists, we like to separate them. At least dialectically, I want to leave open the possibility that we could know the existence of something. We can know the existence of something whose nature we don't know. It could turn out to be impossible, in which case, then some philosophy will end up excluding that. Okay, so uh, maybe time to... Uh, oh. okay, sure. um, so far, very clear, uh, but I have one clarification on the importance of uh, verbal reports on phenomenal consciousness. I think you used 12 times the term verbal reports. So I want to see if you have a clear connection, a clear link between verbal reports and the existence of or whatever the, uh, the phenomenality of consciousness, because uh, it seems that phenomenal consciousness and verbal reports must at most has a contingent relationship. Um, you endorse that Nagel's argument somehow uh, I have no doubt that the bats have some phenomenality. I have no doubts that my dogs have phenomenality. So I don't know what, why there's so recalcitrant insistence in verbal reports, because they are not necessarily a role for phenomenal consciousness. Uh, 
Yeah, I agree, and I certainly didn't mean to imply that they were, uh, they were, necessarily, they were necessary, merely that they exist, they're sometimes made, and that we take it as a working assumption that when they're made, they have some connection to phenomenal consciousness. Many scientists of consciousness take it that our best evidence of phenomenal consciousness in other people um, is the verbal reports they make. I think none of those people, none of those scientists thinks that one cannot be, one is only conscious when one makes a verbal report. That would be an extremely implausible view. Uh, some people, maybe some people approach the view that a view that a mental state is phenomenally conscious, if and only if it's reportable, I think that is still far too strong a view. No, for present purposes, all I need is the claim that some people frequently make these verbal reports. That's a fact that needs explaining. Um, in fact, this will, this will become relevant later when I talk about theories of consciousness, but I'm certainly not making that assumption. Um, hi. So uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about, uh, uh, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that there needs to, there is a requirement that there should be a, a topic neutral explanation of these reports, these problem reports or problem intuitions. And so I would like to know more about why you're assuming that. And, and I guess that, that, that it kind of falls in different ways if you're a materialist or you're a dualist, and especially you as a sympathizer of dualism, I just don't understand why you would require that. A couple of reasons. I mean, I think it's an optional requirement, and it very much depends on what purposes you want to put the meta problem to. Here's one purpose for which one might want to use the meta problem, to give a potential debunking argument about consciousness and to investigate debunking arguments. I think for that purpose, it's quite important that they be topic neutral. If they're not, a debunking argument won't get off the ground. Another purpose is just having a neutral empirical research program that can stay neutral on many matters, many matters of strong philosophical dispute, including the question of whether consciousness exists and is uh, reducible or irreducible. Nonetheless, you are certainly right, there are other research projects, just, for example, understanding consciousness and its causal role, for which one might not want to impose that requirement in advance. And I'm certainly you know, open to approaches to explanations that don't. That said, um, when you said that a dualist will want to reject this requirement, I guess, I guess that's unclear to me. I mean, I don't see why a dualist account of the causal role of consciousness can't be structuralized just as well as a materialist account. In the standard Ramsey theoretic way, every time you say consciousness plays this role, you just say there exists a property that plays this role. I mentioned how that might work in the quantum mechanics case. Now maybe there will be some very unruly forms of dualism where that's impossible. If that's your view or someone's view, then I think, okay, then you take that last horn of explaining why that's impossible, but it's at least far from, unclear, far from clear to me why even on a dualist approach there shouldn't be a potential topic neutral explanation. Okay, so uh, maybe now I can go on to talk a bit about potential solutions. Oh, oh sorry, it's going on. Okay, so It turns out there's actually been quite a lot of discussion of the meta problem in the literature, not under that name. Um, so as far as I know, I introduced this name as a name for this problem. People have put, used the word meta problem for a couple of related things. Um, but in any case, this in any case, there seems to be no very little unified literature on the meta problem. Um, you know, people who've addressed it have largely addressed it as if, you know, they're the first one to think about it or without criticizing other approaches to the meta problem. One thing I'm hoping to do here is to get different proposals in engagement with each other so we can uh, develop a unified problem here. Is there something I can help with? Hey guys. Okay, no. Good. Um, so, one thing I want to do here is to review different proposals in the, uh, the literature. So I think 
what exists today. I think what exists today is interesting and many components of the explanation of these explanations may be potential components of a solution to the meta problem, but nothing we have yet is at least uh, close to being a fully satisfactory solution to the meta problem. But some of the ideas which I'll cover, these are, these are some of the more promising ideas that I think are out there that may well be components of a potential solution. Ideas about introspective models, phenomenal concepts, introspective opacity, primitive quality attribution, primitive relation attribution, and the sense of acquaintance. After that, I'll briefly mention a few ideas that I don't find quite as promising. So, I mean, the first idea which occurs to almost anyone thinking about this problem, which is surely going to be part of a potential solution, is the idea that we have models of our own mental states, our own systems, um, which somehow play a role in generating our intuitions about consciousness, our intuitions about the physical world, involve the model of the external world, our intuitions about consciousness somehow involve models of the internal world. And perhaps these models will explain our sense that there is a problem of consciousness. The person who I think has pushed this idea the most systematically is Michael Graziano in his book Consciousness and the Social Brain where he really develops the idea that our sense of consciousness arises from models of attention and other cognitive processes. He doesn't really apply this at length to the meta problem. He says briefly that maybe these models can explain why consciousness seems so mysterious and ethereal. He doesn't really give a, uh, an account of how, and I think you know, the big question for any approach like this is how do those models explain our sense that consciousness is primitive or there's a problem of consciousness. So I think this approach is going to need more substantive ideas to be made to work. That's going to be this book. Another idea, which is surely central, surely going to be central to any plausible explanation, is that there are special concepts by which we think about consciousness. I know this is an idea that many people in this room have thought about. Uh, Cardi Barlog is one of the pioneers of this strategy. And, uh, Wilson organized a wonderful conference on this topic back in back a few years ago. Possibly goes back to a Nagel and a footnote of what it's like to be a bat. Brian Law also developed this view. Um, the view that we have special introspective concepts of our mental states that are somehow independent of physical concepts, at least in their conceptual or their inferential roles. And these somehow play a central role in explaining our problem reports. This is typically in the literature being used to defend a form of identity <coughs> theory about consciousness, on which consciousness is a physical process without our realizing it. But I think it can equally, there's a version of the phenomenal concept strategy which can be applied more directly to the meta problem, possibly grounding an illusionist view. In any case, I think that something like this surely has to be part of the explanation. The question is whether it gives anything like a complete explanation. One worry I have uh, for this kind of view is prima facie, it looks like we've got many other concepts of mental states that don't generate the same kind of gap. For example, I think it's uh, very plausible we, we have introspective concepts of belief and judgment and so on, uh, which are also somehow independent of our physical concepts, but which don't seem to generate the same substantive explanatory gap intuitions in the same sense of a hard problem you know I mentioned already my belief that Paris is in France I think that we have um, we very plausibly have concepts of belief like that which are uh, independent of our physical concepts which don't seem to generate the same kind of explanatory gap maybe there are explanatory gaps for belief but at least it's very different in kind so anyway I think more needs to be said to distinguish the very substantive gap that seems to arise for phenomenal experiences. Okay, I keep pressing the uh, computer which is playing no causal role here. <laughs> A third idea, perhaps most closely associated with David Arm 
Armstrong, but also discussed by many others, is that somehow introspection is opaque as to the nature of consciousness, something which Sophia was, uh, was bringing up just a moment ago. Uh, Armstrong said that, okay, we don't introspectively see that consciousness is physical, so we're somehow led to see it as non-physical. We make a false inference. We don't see it as physical, so we somehow automatically infer that it's non-physical. And Armstrong likens this to the so-called headless woman illusion, which was popular in, in 19th century circuses. Um, so here's the headless woman illusion, with apologies for the, uh, for the somewhat violent name. Um, um, in, this, in this booth, you know, someone sits in the booth and their head is covered with a veil arranged in a special way. So at least for a moment, you don't see the person's head, and at least for a moment, it looks as if they had, have no head. Ah, the amazing headless person. Um, now I think of a moment, so Armstrong suggests, oh, we automatically make this inference. I don't see their head, so they have no head. When a moment's reflection suggests that really can't quite be right. Okay, now I don't see the head of the two people that I've seen before. Does it, does it appear that any of them have no head? No, it absolutely does not. That, uh, somehow that perceptual illusion only arises under very, very special circumstances. It's not automatically made. I think the same point goes for seeing that something is, uh, is non-physical. Uh, there are many things. There are many things that we see to be that we don't see to be physical. Yeah, maybe a computer I'm working with. I don't see the internal processes. For all I know, they could be physical. They could be non-physical in some broad sense. Do they thereby seem to be non-physical? No. So if we make this inference in the case of introspection, we only make it for reasons very, very specific to that case, and those reasons would need to be explored, and that's where our solution to the problem must lie. There's also a question as to whether the same issue arises for almost any mental state, such as belief again. An idea which I, I find fairly promising in general when thinking about many phenomena is that our models of the world attribute primitive properties to things even when, even when those properties are not instantiated. I've explored this idea, especially in the case of color. But as have many people, there's an idea out there that color experience attributes primitive properties to objects when in fact they have complex reducible properties. So in my actual conception and the fall from Eden, I suggest that the color attributes primitive Edenic properties to things, Edenic redness of a kind that might have existed in the Garden of Eden. That was the conceit. And the thought is actually nothing in our world has those Edenic properties. No primitive properties are had by things out there corresponding to redness, just complex surface reflectances and the like. <coughs> Nevertheless, we attribute Edenic qualities to things in our models because they form a very useful model of a non-Edenic world. You can tell an evolutionary story about why such models are much more useful than really complicated things involving reflectances. So it's very natural for the external world. Natural to suggest we do something similar with our introspective models of the mind. One version of this has been put forward by Dirk Perriman in his work on introspective inaccuracy, saying basically we attribute Edenic qualities of consciousness to the mind that the mind doesn't instantiate. I think that's an interesting and uh, promising beginning of a view. I mean, one worry about it is it tends to construe conscious states themselves as qualities, as qualia-like entities. Um, that's the view that in recent years has become fairly unpopular. You know, there is the qualities of redness and greediness are certainly closely associated with consciousness, but prima facie, you know, our experience of redness is not merely a quality of um, either a simple quality of redness, whether mental or physical, it involves an experience of a quality or an awareness of a quality, maybe some kind of relation to a quality. So for that reason, I think to avoid commitment to a strongly quality-centric view of the mind, well, here's an illustration of the uh, Edenic view, attributing primitive redness to things in the world, but then experience seems to involve an awareness or an experience of primitive redness 
to um, a, a better version of this, this view in the mental case will involve primitive relation attribution. Introspective experience attributes a primitive relation, <coughs> relation of awareness to quality. So I'm aware of redness, I'm aware of greenness. And it's really, I think, the awareness or the experience that poses the hardest part of the heart problem, not the qualities themselves. Again, I think okay, that's going to be a, maybe that will lead to a useful model of the internal world. You can easily see developing a Graziano style introspective model approach where we model, say, attention as involving primitive relations that are not, in fact, instantiated. But again, I think much more needs to be said to explain why and how and why an exactly parallel phenomena doesn't arise for a belief and the like. Something extra which I think has to be added to explain what's distinctive of the consciousness case is our sense of acquaintance with consciousness itself, or our sense of immediate knowledge of consciousness itself. Our internal model don't just somehow tell us as part of a model that there's consciousness. It gives us a sense that we're acquainted with it, that it's there in some completely undeniable way, and that maybe it plays some foundational role in our knowledge of ourselves and of the world. That's the sense of being acquainted both with concrete qualities in the world and especially with our awareness of them. So in my own work on my own thinking about the meta problem over the years, I've tried to give a role to this, but it still raises substantive questions of just how that works and why that's a natural and useful feature for the mind to have. So I don't think we yet have a... Those are, those are the parts of the solution that I would favor. I don't think it's anything like a complete solution. There are other ideas out there which I discussed in the written version of this talk and criticize as being not quite as promising. There's the old idea that our sense of consciousness involves taking qualities in the world and Introjecting them into the mind. Uh, Avenarius, perhaps, uh, at least gave his view its name. Frank Jackson, and indeed UT Place's phenomenological fallacy involve versions of this view. There's the idea that a few philosophers have put forward in the last couple of decades that consciousness involves some kind of use mentioned fallacy, that somehow phenomenal concepts are different from physical concepts because the vehicles in actually deploying those concepts, you have some phenomenology for, in one case but not the other. The vehicles have different features. One involves phenomenology and one not. And somehow we project that difference into the content. I mean, I think this would require very, very, this would require the mind to be making a very, very dumb mistake. We don't normally make those these tension errors. So this at the very least would uh, need some serious explanation. Then its view, I think, involves a combination of some of these ideas. There's the possibility of evolutionary views, but I think those will always be incomplete. In any case, putting together, here's the possible summary of the kind of approach to the meta problem that I like, very much a partial approach. <coughs> One thing I like about this, this summary is I've written it in a way so it's completely neutral between realism and illusionism about the, about the meta problem. If you're an illusionist, read this as an account of the illusion of consciousness and how it's generated. If you're a realist, read this as an account of how real consciousness actually generates our sense of consciousness. So, something like this. We have introspective models deploying introspective concepts of our internal states that are largely independent of our physical concepts. These concepts are introspectively opaque, not revealing any of the underlying mechanisms. Our perceptual models perceptually attribute primitive perceptual qualities to the world, and our introspective models attribute primitive mental relations to those qualities. These models produce a sense of acquaintance both with those qualities and with our awareness of those qualities. And that's, I think, I don't know to what extent that's really an explanation, and to what extent it's just a more detailed account of the explanation. I mean, to me, it's somewhere, somewhere in between those two things, indicating that much more needs to be said to explain why all this happens, but this is at least, maybe something like this is at least part of what's going on and specifies more clearly some of the things that need to be explained. I mean, there are various ways you might go about testing ideas here. In principle, you can test potential solutions to the meta problem with psychological studies and computational models. 
There's only one computational model that I know of so far that tries something like this. Last year, there was a, two, uh, two AI researchers, Luke Mulhauser and Mark Schlageris, built a simple software agent, a kind of computational model based on some ideas that I've mentioned in this vicinity earlier and that Francois Camera um, has developed. He's another guy that's done some quite interesting work on illusionism. They basically built a software model with very, a few very simple principles about colors, about their, its representation of colors, about physical processes, and from certain simple axioms, following some of the principles we laid out, they generated you know, conclusions like, uh, oh, my experience of color is not identical to a physical state, and so on. So this computer ended up being an intuitive dualist. Okay, so that's, a, that's interesting. That was a very, very simple model. I don't think they would claim it captures anything like what's going on in the, uh, the human case, but nonetheless, it shows the possibility of a research program and computational modeling to try and capture the mechanisms behind our judgments. You can imagine developing that program further and further to get computational models that issue reports very much like ours. Raises the question, if a machine issues the same sort of problem reports as us, caused by similar mechanisms, then should we say the machine is itself conscious? <coughs> so just say our AI is not saying things, well, you know, I know that in principle I'm just a bunch of silicon circuits, but I feel like so much more. Then is the machine conscious? I mean, some people have suggested this is, these kind of problem reports could serve as a kind of Turing test for artificial consciousness. Uh, Aaron Sloan might have been the first, and more recently, Susan Schneider and Ed Turner have suggested this. Well, that's one possibility. A very good model of the meta problem processes will bring consciousness with it. Of course, the other possibility is something like this. The poor machine has just, you know, has just learned to simulate these reports. Um, it's gone through a whole bunch of, oh, circles and hoops and obstacles just to simulate those down human consciousness reports in order to pass that, that Turing test by the talk like a human study guide and in fact it's not conscious at all. I think choosing between those, those views is itself a very substantive question. Okay, so that was potential solutions. Let me just say something briefly about impact on theories of consciousness. So I think, as I've said, a solution to the meta problem and a solution to the hard problem will be closely connected, even if one's a strong realist about consciousness. Let's assume realism for a moment. Here's, I think, a plausible principle. Whatever, just say we've got a theory of consciousness that gives a certain basis for consciousness, say, in the brain. Then whatever explains consciousness, according to such a theory, should also partly explain our judgments about consciousness. And here the rationale is that it would be strange if the basis of consciousness plays no role in generating judgments about consciousness. I mean, it would be very strange if those things were somehow dependent. <coughs> we're conscious for one reason, and we say these things for an entirely independent reason. It would be a very bizarre coincidence. Um, so I think that gives us a kind of test for theories of Consciousness. If a theory of consciousness says that mechanism M is the basis of consciousness, then M should also partly explain judgments about consciousness. Now, note that I don't say M should wholly explain judgments about consciousness. I mean, as uh, Gabrielle was saying, one can certainly be conscious without making these verbal reports and probably without making any such judgments. So there are going to be further elements that enter into judgments than reports. Introspective mechanisms, report mechanisms, but you'd hope there's going to be a basis for those things in the brain. If there's a basis for consciousness in the brain, that will also be what feeds into the introspection and report mechanisms. So this is, gives you a kind of test for theories of consciousness. One can apply to different theories. And one example is Tononi's integrated information theory of consciousness, where integrated information, which he measures by quantity phi, is the basis of consciousness. Somehow. Consciousness depends on how integrated um, the system is. And very, he measures integration by phi. Systems with high phi are conscious. Question, how does integrated <coughs> integration explain problem
on reports. Is there some connection between a system having high pride and being disposed to make these judgments or these reports or in systems that do make these reports? How does Phi help explain them? And there's a worry here, which is on the face of it, Phi seems dissociated from report processes in various ways. One worry is that on Zunomi's theory, you have a simulation of an integrated system, of a high Phi system with zero Phi. It'll make the same reports, Phi will be low. It also sure looks like you can get fairly low Phi systems, only a little bit of integration, still making reports of consciousness. So there's at least a challenge there for IIT to answer. One can raise uh, similar, similar challenges for other views. In fact, this general strategy of using the meta problem as a challenge for theories of consciousness goes at least as far back as Tom Nagel's review of Armstrong's book, A Materialist Theory of Mind, back in 1970, where he said, ah, oh, well, if Armstrong was right that uh, mental, our concepts of mental states was merely the concept of certain functional states, there's a mystery why we should have been as puzzled by the mind as we are. Um, he applied this in particular to the problem of other minds. He said, well, Armstrong's strategy, mental concepts are functional concepts, makes the problem of other minds trivial. Because it's pretty trivial to see how other people have those functional states. If that's all our mental concepts were, the problem of other minds would be trivial. We wouldn't be puzzled by it. But we are puzzled by it. Therefore, mental states, mental concepts are not functional concepts. And one could do just the same for the mind-body problem or the explanatory gap problem if our mental concepts were, were uh, just functional concepts. If our phenomenal concepts were functional concepts, the hard problem would just seem like another easy problem. It doesn't. So analytic functionalism is false. I could also give the kind of critique I gave for IRT to biological theories, to quantum theories, maybe even to panpsychism. How does the mechanism that solves the combination problem for panpsychism, explaining our consciousness, how does that feed into reports? And maybe there's a version that applies to global workspace or higher order theory. You might ask, what kind of positive theory works well with the meta problem? I don't have a really, um, a really strong view about that, I'm inclined to think that something giving a role to, say, acquaintance, if you're going to be a realist about consciousness, I think something involving a special kind of acquaintance with consciousness, or would suddenly play some very central role in explaining our problem intuitions. We just simply want to be neutral and sketch a kind of reductive, broadly functionalist story. What fits best with the meta problem? I think maybe, I mean, it's at least tempting to appeal to higher order thought theories but where the relevant higher order thoughts are not just, hey, that I'm having a certain mental state, but higher order thoughts that attribute certain special properties, like primitive properties. Call this primitive higher order thought theory, where conscious states, higher order thought theory says conscious states are states that are objects of higher order thoughts, that we're having those states. Primitive higher order thought theory says conscious states are states that are objects of higher order thought involving special primitive concepts. You know, higher order thoughts saying, ah, oh, I'm having one of these primitive. This state has these primitive properties. And something like that seems to go on, at least in um, some of our higher order thinking. Now, for various reasons, I'd be inclined to reject that view, not least for the reason that Gabriel gave earlier, it seems you can be conscious without these higher order thoughts. But maybe a more plausible view in the vicinity involves something like dispositions to have higher order thoughts, or even better, the basis of those dispositions. So maybe consciousness is the first order basis of dispositions to the objects of those states. What is that first order basis? Well, in my view, perhaps some form of acquaintance. We'll play that role. It's some form of acquaintance with consciousness that disposes us to have these thoughts. But maybe there are other views available. Anyway, this is just speculation. So far, I don't have a well worked out view of what kind of positive theory might work best with the better problem. But I think it's at least interesting to get some ideas like that on the table and think about how the meta problem might play a role in constraining theories of consciousness. Okay, so I've just been over the, the section on possible solutions and on connections to positive theories. Maybe I can take a, um, a couple of questions again. Yeah. Yes, David. I, I mean, <coughs> I'd like to know whether your your point against the not really against, but you're worried about the phenomenal concept strategy, and even about the use management strategy, is also grounded on the possibility of a cognitive phenomenology. Because, I mean, many of the philosophers that do take those strategies
those uh, mental states or mental events that have phenomenality considerably, and they think that beliefs and judgments don't. So I, I would like to know whether you rely on that part of the story or not really. Hmm. It's certainly true that um, <coughs> if you believe in cognitive phenomenology, then you'll think that at least uh, beliefs or at least <coughs> judgments may have some phenomenology, perhaps constitutively. I think there's a version of the worry I was putting about belief that is consistent with that, uh, with that line. And that's the one that just applies to beliefs in general, like my belief that Paris is in France. It's a belief that I had well before I made a judgment to that effect. I take it almost no one thinks that beliefs like that, you know, the, the original belief state um, has an associated phenomenology. Nonetheless, I think we have a, a uh, introspective, we have a concept of belief that we apply in our introspective model. I'm inclined to think that the case that we treat it as a primitive concept is very strong. So the same issue would apply. Now, some people might be inclined to think our concept of belief is a functional concept involving dispositions to make judgments. If they took that line, then, and they think that judgments have a phenomenology, then I still think they're confronted by a weaker version of the problem, which is somehow that the gap for belief doesn't seem as large. The gap for the phenomenology of judgment. Maybe it's there, but it doesn't seem as large as the gap you get for, say, sensory experience and others, and the distinctive gap would still need explaining. Now, maybe there are moves that they can make there. I certainly don't mean to say this belief line is a knockdown reputation. There are at least points to things that need to be filled in on such a story. Yeah, Barry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not controlling here. Okay. So, um, usually the problem you're talking the hard problem, is explained by a contrast with the easier problem of, um, of reducing various kinds of uh, I don't know, biological phenomena or uh, macroscopic phenomena to more fundamental phenomena. But one idea that at least some people are playing with now, I'm not one of them, but I, there's some people who have this, is that that apparently easier problem is much more difficult than people had generally thought. Um, and particularly if the fundamental physics is quantum mechanical, there'll be extra metaphysical principles that are needed in order to identify, in order to do the reduction of macroscopic properties to fundamental properties. So this would be at least a different approach than many of you mentioned, I think. The idea being that the problem is hard all the way around. Yeah, so you mean a different approach to the hard problem, not to the, not, not to the meta problem. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, certainly there are many approaches to the, uh, to the hard problem. And one approach to the hard problem is to say that the, uh, the physical is actually much more complicated than we think. Well, there's a couple of different versions of it. One is that um, even the macrophysical, um, even paradigmatically macrophysical things bring with them explanatory gaps. Um, yeah, that's the Jonathan Schaffer line. And also, in a, in a different way, the Bloch and the Stornicker line. I mean, if I'm really to go into that, I'd say that, well, I'm, I'm doubtful they bring in, well, I'm doubtful that the Bloch and the Schaffer reasons for explanatory gaps are good reasons for anything like the same kind of explanatory gap we get in the case of consciousness. There are certain reasons that arise from more distinctive prop properties of quantum mechanics that I take more seriously, that I also take to be distinct from the worries that Schaffer raised and the Bloch and Thorniker raised. How on earth do you get the class of the world from the quantum wave function? Yeah, that's a, that is itself a very serious explanatory gap, potentially in our, in our, uh, in our physical theories. And there's a lot to say. I think that's a problem almost as hard as the hard problem of consciousness. I think there are things to, to say about it. I also am inclined to think those are very different problems. Even once we close the explanatory gap between, say, the quantum wave function and classically characterizable physical processes, it doesn't close the gap for consciousness, but it's at least an interesting strategy to, uh, to uh, put them together and compare them, uh, see if it can play one off the other. I do think it's a very different strategy from the one I'm, I'm bringing in today. It does, though, suggest one potential solution to the meta problem, which is the reason we get puzzled about the hard problem is we underestimate the physical. Well, we have a misconception of the physical. Okay, good. Yeah, that's a so potential solution to the, uh, to the meta problem. Yeah, we see an explanatory gap between the physical and 
consciousness because we've got a misconception of the physical. I guess I think that helps with some construals of the meta problem, especially the, um, the physical mental gap, but not with others. For example, here's one that doesn't help with so well. Why does it seem that explaining various functions doesn't explain consciousness? I didn't mention physics or the physical in that um, characterization of the, of the meta problem. And that's kind of, that kind of characterization is actually the most, perhaps the most central for me. And I think that various moves about what counts as physical don't, uh, don't quite come to grips with that one. Uh, hello. Uh, so you think it's possible that there are zombies just like us uh, discussing the meta problem of consciousness, right? Uh, so they should have phenomenal intuitions, just like us. And uh, the, their intuitions, of course, uh, rest in some illusion. So do you think that the answer for the meta problem is the same for them and for us? Uh, so I think that if you think it's the same and you defend some kind of uh, dualism, you should think that the answer for the meta problem is much independent of the answer of the first order problem. Um, yeah, this is really, um, this kind of issue is the focus actually of the next, of the next section. So maybe I'll defer a substantive reply until then. But to a first approximation, I'm inclined to think that at least if certain forms of interactionism are false, then there will be topic neutral explanations if there are topic neutral explanations of our reports, those will also apply to zombies. There may be more complete explanations of our reports in terms of realizers that don't apply to zombies. But I am inclined to think there's at least a prima facie issue that there are topic neutral explanations. Um, there's some level of explanation that does apply to zombies. And some people would use that and try and turn it into a debunking argument which is wh what I'm focusing on next. Alternatively, this could push you in the direction, ah, oh, that seems so implausible, could push you in the direction of interactionist dualism. Consciousness involves special properties that play a special role in producing these reports which are not present in zombies. And maybe some topic neutral explanations would have that form. To say you think physical processes cause non-physical consciousness which cause the reports. Then a structuralization of that explanation will say maybe these physical properties cause some other property, some other fundamental property that causes the reports. I didn't mention consciousness, but I still gave a topic neutral explanation. And it might be that explanation doesn't apply to paradigmatic, purely physical zombies, because they don't have any other special property to cause. Those zombies instead have causal gaps in the processes. So in a view like that, the topic neutral explanation might not apply to zombies. And that kind of view might be a version, that might, then might lead to, I think, what you were suggesting, which is, for a really good explanation of consciousness, we're going to need to bring in top, at least topic neutral knowledge of those special non-physical properties and their connection to physical properties, which may itself require a solution to the hard problem. So I th yeah, I think for example, if you're interactionist, you may well think that a really good solution to the meta problem will require something like a solution to the hard problem first. And I don't rule out that order of explanation. It's just a clarification and a, a possible summary slide. Um, in the possible summary slide, it seems that you have... Uh, first, you, s you cited uh, Armstrong as a positive influence, a positive source for your account. Uh, but, of course, you criticize the assumption of materialism. Uh, I would like to know uh, uh, if the, 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 the possible uh, summary slide... I had an impression that you have... A, a very strong schematic resemblance to the way uh, Armstrong proposes the question, but instead of assuming materialism, y you do the, he uses the same as the strategies of uh, Armstrong, but with an ontologically neutral standpoint. Qu could I assume something like that? I think I'm just missing the connection to Armstrong. Armstrong is the opacity. Yeah. Okay. So that's. So what I'm doing here, you might think of this as combining. A bit of Graziano, a bit of Balog, a bit of Armstrong, a bit of Paraboom. Was there something particular though about Armstrong here? Or? The opacity. Yeah, well, I think opacity has got to be part of, surely part of the explanation. I mean, if, 
the fact that consciousness doesn't, that introspection doesn't reveal anything physical, has surely some connection to the fact that that uh, consciousness seems irreducible to the physical. It doesn't remotely suffice, I think, for reasons I've I've suggested. Okay, shall I? Um, okay, who's there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for <laughs> allowing me a second question. Thank him. What? <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Well, uh, the, the way I see the study of the m meta question of, <coughs> sorry, the meta problem of consciousness uh, in a topic neutral way, if it is well succeeded, so do you think it could, for instance, shed light on the question of religious or, or spiritual experience? Because so far, this type of study has been a, uh, a monopoly of, I don't know, history, anthropology, etc. But perhaps with um, this sort of study, this meta problem, the study we could understand why people believe, yeah. because re spiritual experience seems so close to the notion of soul. I'm, I mean, there are atheists who are not uh, monists. They're doing dualist atheists. atheists, and of course. So, what what do you think? Yeah, well, I think it's a very interesting question. Basically, a somewhat more general version of the question is: you know, Is there a connection between the meta problem of consciousness and the meta problem of God, or you know, maybe the meta problem of spirit and other religious? Um, entities. Um, I think, you know, there's a couple of, there's two, at least two possible directions that could go here. One which has seemed attractive, one is that the meta problem, our intuitions about God, partly generate and explain our intuitions about consciousness. Some people have argued that, that somehow, you know, we only, Dennett's argued, we only believe in consciousness because we want to believe in an afterlife and a spirit and a soul. For myself, I find that direction very implausible, perhaps because I'm an atheist, who nonetheless finds consciousness to be a very strong intuitive datum. Yeah, the other potential direction, maybe what you're suggesting, is that somehow our intuitions about consciousness are playing some role in generating our intuitions about God. That's interesting. I haven't thought so much about that. I mean, you might... Perhaps it's certainly, perhaps it's the, you know, a lot of people have intuitions about there being a spiritual element of the world and the world not being merely mechanical and maybe consciousness plays some very central role in that. Spiritual experience could perhaps play some role in that. I'd be very surprised if it exhausts the sources of belief in God or intuitions about God, but it may well be there's at least one potential route there to, uh, one potential route of connection. There may be others. Okay, shall I, um, go on then to the, uh, the final bit, which is, I think, a bit shorter than the others on debunking epiphenomenal again. Okay. Okay, so uh, the last section is really on the issues about illusionism. So illusionism roughly says Consciousness doesn't exist. We just think it does. On this view, a solution to the meta problem will dissolve the hard problem. In a bit more detail, I think illusionism comes in a couple of relevant forms. Strong and weak illusionism. <coughs> Strong illusionism says phenomenal consciousness does not exist. There's no such thing. I've made it up. Weak illusionism says phenomenal consciousness exists but doesn't have the properties we thought it does. I mean, weak illusionism is somehow much more palatable and often more common. My own view is it's not strong enough to really dissolve the hard problem, and the most interesting form for me is strong illusionism. So I'll focus on strong, but I'll also say something about the weak form. Some people think strong illusionism is contradictory. You know, to explain how can you, I mean, you say consciousness is an illusion, but what's the illusion? Isn't that illusion itself involved conscious experience? Perceptual illusions, after all, involve a conscious experience. Doesn't uh, the, 
mustn't the illusion of consciousness do that too? I mean, I don't think the view is that easily defeatable. I think the illusionist can simply reply that, well, the illusion of consciousness is some kind of mental state that doesn't involve consciousness. Maybe, for example, it's a judgment, where these are understood as states that don't essentially involve consciousness. Or maybe even it's a quasi-perceptual illusion, but where the perceptual state is not understood as a conscious state. Maybe it's a non-conscious quasi-perceptual state. So I think there are natural things for the illusionist to say here. One useful comparison might be with the so-called grand illusion about visual experience. Uh, the view that the visual field is rich and precise everywhere, like a very detailed picture. You know, many people have said that vision or visual experience somehow seems very precise and pictorial to us, but vision science says this is false. You know, we've only got precision in a certain very small area um, the visual field, just based on retinal mechanisms. Very imprecise outside the phobia. Um, nonetheless, it seems to us that it's detailed everywhere. Many psychologists and philosophers have tried to explain that illusion by saying, well, there's a kind of a refrigerator light effect. You know how the light is always on in the refrigerator? Whenever you open the door, you assume the light's always on. Well, likewise, whenever you attend to any area of your visual field, you find details there, so you assume the details were there all along. But in fact, uh, that's not the case. So anyway, if you go for the grand illusion view, you'll, many people will say, we have fewer experiences than we think. We seem to have very rich <coughs> visual experiences. In fact, we have very sparse visual experiences. In the sense that we have more, is just generated by somewhat illusory, illusory mechanisms of attention. So that's the grand illusion view. We have fewer experiences than we think. Many uh, philosophers and psychologists have explored this. Just think of um, strong illusionism as taking that view to its, to its extreme. We have many fewer experiences than we think, namely none. But, we, uh, but the grand illusion is generated perhaps by false judgments um, about how rich our experience is. Strong illusionism is generated by an even stronger false judgment. Okay, so I think the best argument for illusionism perhaps by far, are debunking arguments that stem from the meta-problem. I mean, there's a huge literature on debunking arguments in meta-ethics. It's arisen over the last uh, 12 years or so, especially since the work of Street and Joyce. There's also a bit in other areas. God, not much at all when it comes to consciousness. You can find hints of a debunking argument, I think, in Shoemaker, and maybe hints in some illusionists like Dennett. But not a lot. But there's various different ways you might try to formulate a debunking argument for illusionism. Here's one way, which I think is at least a useful start. Premise one, there's a consciousness-independent explanation of beliefs about consciousness. It's a rough version of the claim as a public control <coughs> solution to the meta problem. Premise two, if there's a consciousness-independent explanation of beliefs about consciousness, those beliefs are not justified. That's meant to be a subversion of a standard debunking premise. You know, if there's an explanation about beliefs about God, entirely independent of God, then many people think that gives reasons to think those beliefs are not reliable or justified. Conclusion, beliefs about consciousness are not justified. I mean, that's not yet illusionism. The beliefs could still be true, even if not justified. Once you think our beliefs about consciousness are not justified, it's a fairly small step to say, you know, that the whole basis for realism is gone, and we might as well be an illusionist. So I think this is an interesting argument. There's a lot to, uh, to say about it. There's various natural responses. I mean, one response is to deny premise one. And say, for example, well, beliefs about consciousness are not really topic neutral states. Beliefs about consciousness constitutively involve consciousness itself. That's something I've argued for in some other work. And furthermore, it's beliefs about consciousness that are the objects of justification. So maybe there's something topic neutral in the ballpark, reports, 
what we call intuitions that are somehow watered down, but those aren't really the objects of justification. That's one possible response. The solution to the meta problem explains only phenomenal behavior, and topic neutral states not phenomenal beliefs. You can also deny the second premise by saying, well, phenomenal beliefs have a very special kind of justification that's not sensitive to their history. For example, they're justified by acquaintance. So various discoveries about the history of those, the, the causal history of those beliefs are irrelevant to their justification. I think you know, a deeper kind of response problematizes the very notion of independence. It is actually many different notions of independence here. There's an explanation could not mention consciousness. It can be, give no causal role to consciousness, and give no explanatory role to consciousness. It could happen modally, independently of consciousness. I think you know, one line you can take is the premise to requires that consciousness play <coughs> no causal role. In order, in order for this debunking to work, consciousness has to play no causal role. But as we already saw, premise one doesn't ensure this. Premise one, a solution to the meta problem, at least, doesn't entail that consciousness plays no causal role. And in particular, there's at least one view that seems to neatly thread some of the, uh, the, the premises of this argument. That's the view I call realizationism, the view I mentioned earlier already, and the view on which there's a structural explanation of our beliefs in consciousness that doesn't mention consciousness, but nevertheless consciousness plays a causal role in realizing this structure, and so helps cause our beliefs about consciousness. And I mentioned an interactionist version of that view, and a panpsychist version, Maybe there's also a material explosion. If you go for that line, it looks like, you know, maybe you're off the hook for, depending on what you mean by independence. If it means causal independence, uh, premise one is false. If it means mere descriptive independence, premise two is false because that requires a causal notion. So I think realizationism is not a bad response to this kind of debunking argument. I also feel though that it doesn't scratch the debunking itch. It doesn't fully scratch the itch that's caused by the debunking argument. There's a worries that survive in this response. So this kind of leads to a, uh, to get that itch, that debunking itch further, I'm inclined to articulate what I think of as a coincidence argument. There's sort of an underlying worry that if there's a solution to the meta problem, then even if realism is true, that our beliefs about consciousness end up being true by, more like, by some kind of coincidence. It ends up being a coincidence that they're true. Which is also a line that's been explored in the debunking literature and meta-ethics. So here's a version of this argument. Premise one is the same. There's a consciousness independent explanation of our phenomenal intuitions. Maybe let's here understand that as a modal claim. One that could be a, um, an explanation that could also be true in zombies, just to get a strong form. Uh, zombies have the same phenomenal intuitions, topic neutrally construed, and the topic neutral explanation applies to them. Now the worry is, if there's such an explanation, their correctness is a coincidence. Boy, it's so lucky we didn't turn out to be zombies. You know, zombies go, you know, there are zombies who are physically just like us, who say all these things about their consciousness, they're wrong. Well, if I'm a realist, oh, I'm right. Well, but it shows, boy, I'm kind of lucky that I have this consciousness that makes my, my reports and judgments true. That's premise two. If there's such an explanation of phenomenal intuitions, their correctness is a coincidence. Premise three, if they're correct, it's not a coincidence. It seems very implausible that the correctness of our phenomenal judgments is a coincidence. So conclusion, our phenomenal intuitions are not correct. I find that a slightly more worrying form of the debunking argument myself, but I do feel it's false. I mean, there are things, I think the best, the weakest point here is possibly Premise two, again, you can work with different notions of independence. But I think probably the most promising response is to deny premise two, explaining away the sense of coincidence. And maybe, for example, you might try and say if there are systematic, certain systematic psychophysical laws connecting the report processes and consciousness, that's enough to make it not a coincidence. Still kind of feels like lucky we live in a universe where those psychophysical laws are true. Maybe realizationism can play a 
central role here, if the mechanisms are realized by consciousness, there's still perhaps some sense, boy, lucky we live in a world where consciousness was the realizer and not something else. Head of Merck has a, what you call the phenomenal powers view, where consciousness actually centrally involves some powers that essentially realize certain things. Maybe that can help. Still, there's an underlying worry. If zombie isomorphs exist in some possible world, isn't it still lucky that our phenomenal intuitions are correct? And I have the feeling there's just more that needs to be said here, and this is a bit of a crux for the issue about illusionism. So this is the best case I have for illusionism. I think it's feasible, of course, but very interesting. As for the case against illusionism, well, this is somewhat more straightforward. Here's one version of it. For illusionism to dissolve the hard problem, strong illusionism has to be true. Strong illusionism is false, therefore illusionism cannot dissolve the hard problem. Um, so the first premise involves a critique of weak illusionism, which is basically making the point that weak illusionism doesn't help with the hard problem. I mean, there are lots of weak illusionists who say, you know, the hard problem rests on the idea that consciousness is intrinsic or ineffable or maybe just straight out non physical. Those intuitions are false, therefore the hard problem doesn't arise. My response to all of those weak illusionists is that to get the hard problem off the ground, you didn't need any of those special properties, the intrinsic mm -hmm. even, even the same non physicality. To get, to get things, things like the zombie intuition, intuition and others off the ground, what you need is the something slight of experience, of experience. Not, not, not the proper properties, such as intrinsicness non-physicality, even if you reject those properties. properties. The, the, the basic, basic explanatory gap, gap from consciousness, consciousness still, still remains. remains. Get rid of it by an illusionist strategy if you need to deny that there's, there's consciousness in what, what it's like. like that. And that leads you straight to, to strong illusionism. As for strong illusionism, well, I'm afraid my argument against strong illusionism is not terribly sophisticated. Here's one version of it. People sometimes feel pain, if strong illusionism is true, no one feels pain, so strong illusionism is false. This is basically a consciousness-centric version of the old Murian argument for the external world. Here is a hand, here is another. So the external world exists. It's like, you know, here is an experience of pain. So, so yeah, some people are phenomenally conscious. Um, you know, there's all kinds of fancy footwork you can do here. Most people don't want to deny premise one, so they'll find a way to deny premise two. And say, ah, oh, even if strong illusionism is true, ah, oh, there's still pain, or people undergo pain, they just don't phenomenally experience it. I think all that fancy footwork is ultimately <coughs> misconceived. It just leads back to weak illusionism that doesn't help with the hard problem. I think strong illusionists really should deny premise one. If you're going to be a strong illusionist, you've got to deny what you want to say is, yes, it's totally introspectively obvious that we're conscious, and it's false. Strong illusionism requires denying something absolutely introspectively obvious, such as the claim that we feel pain. And people like Geta have sometimes embraced that view. People, it turns out to be dialectically difficult to embrace this view because it seems so monumentally implausible. I do think it's what the strong illusionist needs to say, though. And I do think the implausibility of Paris one gives a strong case against it. That said, I think strong illusionists should embrace um, the denial of premise line and say, yep, we just have these extremely strong introspective models that make us believe in all these things like feelings of pain that don't actually exist. And yes, the view is unbelievable, but my view predicts that it's unbelievable. The introspective models are so strong. And I think that's what an illusionist should say. That said, the view still is unbelievable. And I think the implausibility of um, denying premise one provides the best argument against it. That said, I still take it seriously. So, okay, so that leads then to my conclusion, which I think you can kind of put this, I have not resolved the dialectic about illusionism. I find it extremely interesting, but I think you can cast where we've got to as a clash between what some people see as absurdity. Here's Galen Strawson on the absurdity of illusionism. There occurred in the 20th century the most remarkable episode in the whole history of ideas, the whole history of human thought. A number of thinkers denied the existence of something we know with certainty to exist. Consciousness. And Gay Allen thinks this is just the most bizarre, ridiculous, and stupid thing ever to have happened in, in philosophy or elsewhere. Okay, so that expresses the, uh, 
the absurdity of illusionism. But what about realism? Well, I think this basically, the absurdity here basically comes down to the, one version of it comes down to the coincidence worry. Here's a version of it articulated by the, the rationalist thinker, uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky, who's raising the point for every phenomenalism, but I think it generalizes to other forms of realism. He says, the zombie argument may be a candidate for the most deranged idea in all of the philosophy. <laughs> Uh, the causally closed cognitive system of Chalmers' internal narrative, you know, his introspective models and all that, <laughs> is malfunctioning in a way that not by necessity, but just in our universe, miraculously happens to be correct. That is, I've got this brain that goes around spinning this ridiculous theory about consciousness, and in most purely physical worlds, that, you know, zombies and so on, that theory is completely false. And there's a miracle in our world that ensures consciousness is present in our world, thereby making um, those beliefs true or not. He thinks that's absolutely absurd. It applies, he raises the wire for every phenomenon, but it applies to other views. I mean, I think there's middle ground here. Obviously, there is middle ground between illusionism and epic phenomenalism, but it tends to slide back to the same problem. You know, weaker forms of illusionism don't help with the hard problem. Weaker forms, other forms of realism are still subject at least to a version of the miraculous correctness critique. So, to get beyond absurdity, I think this is kind of where this dialectic leads us. Each side has more work to do. Illusionists need somehow to explain how having a mind can be like this, even though it's not in all the way that it seems. They just somehow make phenomenological progress without, strictly speaking, phenomenology. Realists need to explain how meta-problem processes are somehow essentially grounded in consciousness, even if it's possible for them to occur without consciousness. So I think there's work to be done. There, so I think a solution to the meta-problem that meets these ambitions may just solve the hard <laughs> problem of consciousness. In the meantime, the meta-problem is a potentially tractable research project for everyone. Thanks. The last slide, slide, not this one, the last one, one. you're talking about two, two possible solutions, right? Uh, maybe you're excluding a third, a third way, is to deny that zombies are possible. So if you are some kind of emergentist that thinks that uh, every time you have physical uh, systems with such and such property, uh, you, you must have consciousness. You can not be. In, uh, you can be a realist uh, and don't have this problem because you don't think that zombies exist. So you think emergentism avoids the problem? I think you're thinking of some kind of emergentism with downward causation, like strong emergentism, where the emergent properties still play a causal role. I mean. I don't think emergentists completely get around the zombie worry. There are still going to be, I mean, you can still give a topic neutral characterization of the emergent properties and their causal role. It still looks to me as if there might be some possible worlds where some other property plays that role. There's not consciousness. A world structurally isomorphic to an emergentist world with the base properties, and maybe even with some special emergent properties, but where those emergent properties aren't consciousness. So maybe the physical properties somehow causally produce, I don't know, some kind of special ectoplasm properties. Nothing to do with the mind. And those cause the behavior. Then you still have the worry, well, lucky that we live in the world where the emergent property is consciousness and not the ectoplasm properties. So at least that's the way in which I see a view like emergentism or interactionism as still being subject to a version of the luck critique. Although, of course, it's a weaker version than epiphenomenalism since they 
allow consciousness to be playing a causal role. interesting and it turns on deep questions about the connection between the self and consciousness and whether a self requires consciousness. I mean interestingly quite a few people have taken the meta problem strategy to argue for well quite a lot of people argue for illusionism about the self without arguing for illusionism about consciousness. Arguably that's the standard view in Buddhism for example there's no self but we're still conscious and you know, people like Thomas Metzinger and others have more recently argued for for a subject view. No self, but we're uh, we're still conscious, and that view seems to involve a view of consciousness without a sense, without a self or without a subject. Now, the question is, how could there be consciousness without a subject? That's a very difficult one. But anyway, the case, the question you're raising is kind of the converse. <clears throat> how could there be a subject without consciousness? Well, I kind of feel like the illusionist has some resources here. It's true that our intuitive notion of a subject might have some essential connection to consciousness. We think of a subject as a subject of experiences. But the illusionist doesn't have to deny all the mental states. They can say, well, there's a, just a somewhat more deflationary notion of a subject. Subject is a subject of mental states, of, for example, beliefs and desires, and maybe even of perceptions where these aren't understood as essentially conscious states. And, you know, arguably we have that, that notion as well, the subject of non of mental states that don't essentially involve consciousness. And perhaps they could use that notion of a subject to defend the subject and the self if they want to, even despite their illusionism about consciousness. So, so I think that you may have just given an argument for physicalism in this talk. Because uh, from the point of view of the meta problem, uh, for, for, you know, so the way that you set it up in the end, that uh, illusionism being one kind of solution for the matter problem, and um, uh, that you know incurs the, the wrath of you know people like Strauss, and this is the most deranged you know view, the most unhingedly alienated you know position, um, and the. On the other hand, there being the, the danger of uh, you know, a realist not being able to give a uh, proper explanation of the meta problem due to the issue of um, you know, the, the cosmic coincidence of how um, consciousness you know, plays, you know, uh, how consciousness is you know, present when we can explain the, 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 the beliefs about it without appealing to that. So, so the physicalist can thread the needle, you know, with the, you know regard to these two problems, because the physicalist can be very good conscience, you know, through the Strawson line, and at the same time, the physicalist can have a perfect explanation of the um, intuitions, you know, the problematic intuitions, in terms of. You know, you can run it two ways. The physicalist can run it in a, in a fully physical. Uh, manner, you know, uh, where, where both the explanandum and the explanants are perfectly good physical um, um, processes, and it also can run the explanation in non-topic neutral, in, in, in uh, phenomenal terms. Uh, in either way, there is no cosmic coincidence, there is consciousness and a perfectly good explanation of our beliefs about consciousness, and also the beliefs uh, you know, about the puzzling nature of consciousness. So it seems like everything you said adds up to a, a, a pretty strong argument for physicalism. Yeah, it's funny. Um, someone else, uh, Absalom Elitzer, said all oh, this added up to an amazingly strong argument for dualism. And uh, <laughs> Henry Murray told me this was a great argument for panpsychism. So somehow everyone finds uh, an argument for their own view. I guess because... <laughs> 
they reasonably fit, thought this through and figure out their view has a way out. I guess, um, I mean, when you say <coughs> physicalism, I guess you're thinking of type B or a posteriori. Yeah. <coughs> physicalism of the kind you've argued for and other work. And I guess, I mean, I totally agree that's a potential way out of a, a bunch of worries here, and I'm more or less assuming that you know, it doesn't work for reasons I've argued against, for reasons I've discussed elsewhere. So I put that into the class of, when I mentioned reductionist strategies early on, said I'm assuming these are, I'm looking for an alternative here. But you're absolutely right, it's a potential um, way out. I don't think it works for completely familiar reasons. Um, you know, prima facie, it's got the, uh, it's got the basic explanatory gap wire, it doesn't solve it. They've got things they try to say about the explanatory gap, which I don't think are, uh, are plausible, but that's going to be true for every, yeah, every potential materialist view, every potential non-materialist view, there are going to be things that they, that they say that may or may not be satisfactory. Is it a distinctively special... I mean, I guess I'm not seeing this as an argument for, um, for physicalism, but in any case, I guess I'm assuming Maybe, maybe the easiest thing to say is I haven't, given, I haven't tried to give a, really a strong argument against any antecedent views here. I've merely tried to explore um, an alternative class of views. Um, is type B physicalism subject to the dilemma at the end? Well, I see type B physicalism as at best a form of weak illusionism, the illusion that brings in a weak, um, weak illusionism. And I think weak illusionism doesn't really help with the hard problems. Um, type B physicalists have something to say about that. Is it also subject to a version of the coincidence dilemma? Well, I kind of worry about. I still kind of feel a version of the luck point, at least for some versions of type B materialism. I mean, it's still conceivable. There are zombies, and the, the, um, the type B materialist says it's. Well, zombies are metaphysically impossible because. Well, it turns out, you know, consciousness is identical to a physical property, but I still feel like epistemologically, boy, lucky that we are uh, lucky that the identities turned out that way. Now I know that there are complex issues about whether, whether identi identities can be true with luck. I think luck is itself an epistemological concept, so I think uh, identities can, at least I feel that, you know, there's a version of the debunking worry, of the coincidence worry, an itch, a version of that itch that's not fully scratched by this worry, but it's a complicated argument. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the argument that uh, weak illusionism uh, isn't sufficient to solve the explanatory gap, and therefore if you want to use or detect the uh, hard problem, therefore if you want to use we, if you want to use illusionism to solve the hard problem, you should use uh, strong illusionism. I guess my basic thought was the weak illusionist says we're wrong about some things about consciousness, and the thing, kinds of th things it says we're wrong about are things like that it's primitive, that it's not explained by the physical, and so forth, and that this mistake or illusion is explicable, explicable in some way. And you said, well, it's sufficient to just have this notion of what it's like. But I guess I'm wondering what's left of the hard problem if it's not failure to be explained, failure to be entailed, failure to be identical. You know, all these things, if they're mistakes that can be explained, such that our judgments, our mistaken judgments can be explained, I guess what's left then just this thin notion of what it's like would maintain. So my, on my conception, at least, of the hard problem, it's, in some sense, at least initially or fundamentally epistemological. It starts with epistemic data and then goes on to, leads to ontological conclusions, but that, at least in some hands, like in my hands, but that's not an essential part of the hard problem itself. So data such as Mary seems to learn new facts, she couldn't have got from the physical facts, the conceivability of zombies, and physical explanations only explain all that functional stuff, don't explain uh, consciousness. I see all those as basically involving a certain kind of epistemic gap. And my thought here is that all you need to get an epistemic gap off the ground 
is the what it's like conception of consciousness. You don't need initial, you don't need initial assumptions about intrinsicality or ineffability or non-physicality. You can stay agnostic and all those things and say, as long as I've got, I've got the face of what it's like conception of consciousness, and I can imagine the physical processes being like so, with that being absent. Um, it just seems, whatever we say about these things, it seems intuitive. That Mary learns new facts about what it's like to see red. You, you still seem to have the explanatory gap of explaining all these functional things. doesn't explain consciousness. Many of the mistakes that you mentioned in your explanation sounded metaphysical to me. Like, yeah, the intuition that it's non-physical, the claim that it's non-physical, or the claim that it's um, not identical. I guess I'm thinking of those also as not required to generate, those mistakes are not required to generate the hard problem, because again, the hard problem only requires the epistemic gap. I mean, you might worry about the move from an epistemic gap to an ontological gap, that's a perfectly legitimate worry, but again, I don't think of that as part of the basic intuition that generates the problem, that's locating, that's locating a solution to the problem elsewhere in a false inference that we, uh, that we make. You also, you touched on a couple of epistemic data in, like, about explanation in what you said, and maybe Maybe there's a version of this line that somehow questions some epistemic intuitions without questioning what it's like. But I'd like to see, I guess I'd like to see more details about how that goes. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk about the meta problem. Um, I hope there's not any more questions about it because I really wanted to ask you something. Um, I'm doing a master's project about extended mind theory, and I stumbled upon a question, and I'd like to end the uh, question. Um, in Memento's Revenge, an article in 2010, Clark recognizes a dilemma between concepts of mind in the current debate. Uh, basically, uh, one is the mind as consciousness and current beliefs, and the other is mind as extended to unconscious processes and long-term beliefs. Uh, obviously, the extended mind goes by the second conception. Um, Clark claims that a science of mind would be a science of multiple interconnected causal mechanisms whose only point of intersection could consist in their function of informing conscious choice and reflection processes. Well, the question is the following. Due to the impacts in cognition science, the cognitive extension theory or uh, area of studies uh, has, and the functionalism adopted by both of you in the original paper, would the commitment to this dilemma be necessary? In sum, considering this dilemma and your liberal, liberal functionalism, is the step from cognitive to mind extension necessary? Yeah, uh, that's interesting. And I, I mean, I'm inclined to think that some of the issues here about <coughs> what counts essentially as mental are terminological issues. I don't mind, a, say, a stipulation that only consciousness is mental. But it just seems obvious to me we're going to need some word in the vicinity of mental, some category that covers things like beliefs that we have, even when they're not conscious. I mentioned earlier my belief that Paris is in France. Maybe occasionally that rises to the surface of consciousness and issues in a conscious judgment that Paris is in France. But we ordinarily, we ordinarily say that I believed it all along. There's a whole lot of things that I believe, whether or not I'm considering them at the moment. Whether or not you want to say that's truly mental, I think those are very, very important traits that we appeal to all the time in characterizing people and in explaining their behavior and so on. So there are these states. And if you don't want to call them mental, I'll just appropriate another word and call them, say, psychological. And maybe to totally avoid verbal disputes, let's call the other ones phenomenological. So okay, now we're going to have a psychological, a group of states which are phenomenological, a group of states which are psychological. And I'm happy to allow that extended mental states, the ones that Andy and I argued for, Otto's state of believing something through his notebook. I'm happy to allow they're not phenomenological, but it seems at least obvious they're on a par with the psychological. Um, that if they exist, they're on a par with those. And, and the, so the core claim then can be understood that psychological states 
can be extended. And, you know, and psychological states, even non-conscious ones, are very, very important to us. People's beliefs, desires, and so on, it's just of their character, play a role in their explanation. So then, extended mental states will still be psychological. I think that's all we need for the extended mind thesis. If you want to reserve the word mind for mind, oh, you, you said cognition. Okay, I'll call this extended cognition. I'll say, well, isn't that going to be enough for, for my purposes? Philosophical religion is never to get hung up on words. You know, if you want to keep the word word, for, the word mind for some purpose, then fine, I'll use the word cognition. What's going to matter to me is say that extended states can be on a par with things like my belief that Paris is in France, even when I'm not entertaining with it. If you want to use some other word for the status of that belief, say cognition, then that's good enough for me. Dave, I didn't understand your answer to a couple of questions um, about the epi relation between the epistemic premises and the um, ontological conclusion. The physicalist thinks that there's a physical explanations for the epistemic premises and draws the conclusion that there's no reason to posit anything other than the physical to explain them. Is it that you're rejecting the particular explanations that the physicalist is giving? Um, I would say no. I mean, I think this whole talk, I was open to physicalist explanations of the epistemic premises. There are two very different physicalist strategies here. There's an illusionist version of the strategy and a realist version of the strategy. And I would give very, very different arguments against the, uh, the two of them. My version, the realist version of the strategy basically ends up being the type B physicalist strategy, and I've argued against those, uh, those explanations in a whole bunch of other works, most notably my paper on phenomenal concepts and the explanatory gap. For today's purposes, I'm, interest, I'm especially interested in a different physicalist strategy, the illusionist strategy, which I think I view as much more tenable um, in certain ways, but also massively implausible in, uh, in other ways. But back in that paper on phenomenal concepts and the explanatory gap, I basically said to get the realist explanation of the epistemic intuitions off the ground was basically going to require what I call thick phenomenal concepts and a certain kind of acquaintance that was going to be itself very, very difficult for the physicalist to explain. Then we get into a lovely dialectic that I've been back and forth with Kathy about for years now, and so on. I don't want to go over all that territory, but I guess I, I would argue that in a certain sense the realists um, explanation is problematic in a way in which the illusionist is not, although the illusionist is problematic in a different respect. So there doesn't seem to be such a sharp distinction, though, to me, between the weak illusionist and the type B strategist, because... No, when I said illusionist just now, I meant strong illusionist. I agree that type B materialists tend to be weak illusionists. I don't think weak illusionism helps, partly for reasons I've articulated here, and partly for the reasons I articulated in that paper. Yeah, I want to ask something. Uh, so right, let's suppose uh, there are two options here. One is uh, that there is consciousness and everything, or there's not. And if take the debunking argument that I could explain, let's suppose to that I could explain uh, my beliefs and consciousness and uh, by means of you know, appealing to this topic neutral stuff, so let's suppose that the debunking illusionist kind of argument works. Uh, but then I, I could also run this uh, the debunk, debunking argument uh, uh, with the premise that there is consciousness, and even if there is, you could come to believe that there is not because of the debunking argument, and so I tell the whole story again. Uh, and then we come up to this uh, if there is consciousness, the kind of evidence we will have, whatever story you have of the reports about consciousness, right, uh, will not be, you will not know that by means of reports of anyone else, right? Not other people's reports. It will be 
something that you experience, and that's not a report in any important sense. So uh, when you say that the problem of illusionists is that they don't really have a complete or satisfying story about how, why we feel the way we do, right? Why I feel this, and blah, 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 the pain. Uh, the kind of evidence, if there is consciousness, uh, is not supposed to be something you can, uh, it's, it's going to be, you're not going to know that by reports. So whatever, explain the reports, you keep the, the hard problem, you, you keep the problem. Is there a consciousness? I can tell a story. If there is, you believe in what you do. If not, yes, you still believe in what you do. Is it coincidence? Oh, I have this evidence. So I, I kind of agree with our Murian argument. It's just, yeah, I feel this. That's the evidence. That's it. I mean, how can we go forward? Didn't catch everything there. For some reason, your voice and that microphone are uh, oh. running badly for my hearing. But um, this was a defense of potential defense of illusionism. Actually, it's a defense that the argument against illusionism is not going to come from. Uh, uh, showing that the debunking argument does not work. Can you just step straight without the microphone? I'll, I'll oh. send you better, I think, without the microphone. Is it better now? Down the... Better now? Yeah, much yeah, better. Just no much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just Yeah. All right. So the whole thing is, uh, let's uh, grant that you can tell a story that explain all of the reports, uh, uh, Take the illusion is the story, so the debunking argument is right. But then we still have this thing that uh, if there is consciousness, I can debunk the debunking argument and tell a story that you will believe that there is no consciousness uh, and so on. Yeah. So the, the only relevant evidence is not like what explained reports, but this kind of direct evidence that you came up with yeah. the Murren story. Yeah. So I think it end, ends up to that. It? How can we move forward? Yeah, well, this is the, the obvious problem for illusionism is the, the Murian problem. It's not some complicated argument that the best explanation of our reports involves consciousness. Um, that would somehow br be bringing in consciousness as a theoretical notion. I don't think consciousness is a theoretical notion. I think it's an observational notion. It's our most secure observational notion, something of which we're certain. And I'm basically, ultimately, with Galen Strawson here. I think it's a datum. And I think denying it, to deny it is to reject a datum. Except that I'm not quite as hardline as Galen about this. I at least, even though the view strikes me initially as absurd, I see at least philosophical room for it that's worth exploring. But basically, the challenge for the illusionist is to overcome that sense that somehow they are denying the, uh, the data. I mean, it's a very simple version of illusionism. It says, oh, look, I can explain the reports, and that's all I needed to do. And then I think that's just not coming to grips with the data. I kind of have the feeling that maybe there are, there are things the illusionists can do which are stronger than that. I mean, at the very least, they might say, I'm explaining the beliefs, I'm explaining the sense, but ultimately, it's all going to be ultimately in some dispositional sense. Mm -hmm. We're going to come against the worry that merely explaining our dispositions is not yet coming to the grips with the data. So. It's just a sense more, look, I agree that this is where the action arises for illusionism, whether it's ultimately, they're going to say it's not a, it's not a non-negotiable mm -hmm. datum. And they're going to say that, in fact, we can make theories of consciousness that don't respect the alleged datum. But the view is always going to seem unbelievable to a large group of people. They can then predict that they're, in the next movement for them to say, oh, it might be predicts that you'll find it unbelievable which I think has got a certain dialectical strength. But still, the view is unbelievable. Um, so I think the work for the illusionists to, to do is to try and make their view at least a bit more believable than it is now. I don't know that that can be... I'm sure that, that can be done to some extent. But really, the reason why I left that open at the end is by saying that's, I think, where the, uh, the work remains to be done. So basically, your point came down to it. Doesn't this ultimately come down to whether this is a more introspective datum or not. I do, I do agree, that's what the argument with the illusionist um, comes down to. My hope is that maybe some solutions to the meta problem might potentially open up the gap for uh, denying the Morian claim and explaining it away. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's yet been done. Right. <laughs> do you think it can be done? Ultimately, I suspect that it can't be done, yeah, which is why I'm not 
And why I'm not an illusionist, I think it probably can't be done well enough, but I'm not 100% certain of that, which is why I give 0 0.03 credence to, a, to <laughs> the truth of illusion. Right. Okay. Yes, that's about it. We're going to, uh, let me just see. Uh, we're going to be back here now at uh, 3.50, uh, is it? Yeah, 3.50 in the afternoon. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much, David. Thank you.